thank you for joining us once again. Uh, two of our um, panelists have been able to join us since the first session. So welcome Matt Hart and welcome Eileen Pollard. We look forward to hearing from you both in this next session. Uh, unfortunately, Jeanette Carpenter can't be with us, so she won't be chairing this session, but David has very kindly uh, agreed to step into the breach. So David, over to you. Thank you so much for attending the second sex session of this wonderful conference, uh, this session entitled Writing the Marginal. Uh, my name is David Kenny. You may recognize me from the uh, first panel just minutes ago, and I'm standing in here as a, a chair um, uh, in the absence of our scheduled chair who, who regrets her, her inability to be here. Um, it's my very great pleasure to introduce this session and our three brilliant panelists that I'll just introduce very briefly now to not uh, 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 spend too much time on it because I think they will uh, do themselves so much credit. Uh, and then I will hand over to Eileen to take us away. To first introduce uh, Dr. Eileen Pollard, who until recently was at the University of Chester and now once again at Manchester Metropolitan University, where she uh, uh, received her PhD. She specialises in contemporary literature and theory and, amongst other uh, fabulous scholarly publications, has written uh, and co-edited Hilary Mantel, uh, Contemporary Critical Perspectives, and the author of the wonderful uh, Origin and Ellipsis in the Writing of Hilary Mantel uh, from 2019, and we'll be hearing from her first. Second, we have Terry Baker, Mount Royal University in Calgary in Canada, who also has her PhD from the University of Calgary. Her scholarship specializes in contemporary British literature with a particular interest in how historical fiction cha challenges national narratives. And amongst other scholarly publications on Victorian women and Ian McEwan, she has written on the virtue of Hilary Mantel. Lucy Arnold, uh, our other co-convener of this conference, conference uh, from the University of Worcester, has her PhD from Leeds University and specialises in contemporary literature, uh, in particular around narratives of haunting, and author of the wonderful monograph Haunted Decades, rereading Hilary Mantel from 2019. We're going to start with Eileen, who I'm very excited to hear is presenting on The Giant O'Brien, neglected historical novel and uh, one of my favourites. So Eileen, if you can take us away. Okay, thanks, David. Thanks so much for that introduction. Um, I'm hoping that you can see my slides. Sorry about the uh, slightly clunky way in which I shared those. Um, and apologies for being late. As David has said, I've actually changed role. Um, I'm going to be talking today about the giant O'Brien. As I'm actually no longer an academic, this has liberated me in a few ways. And this paper actually constitutes my final word on Mantel's writing. As I'm now also working full time in quite a different role, I've not had the time that I would have liked to prepare for this session, so do forgive me, but I have put together a few thoughts which I hope will provide us with some room for discussion. So what I'm wanting to discuss primarily is whether this novel has been neglected. Um, so one of the things that I think is interesting about Mantel, as we know, is that she's become extraordinarily famous through her historical fiction, primarily the Tudor trilogy, um, most recently The Mirror and the Light. But she has written other historical novels, most notably this one, which was published in 1998. I've tried to think about this in terms of the chronology of Mantel's writing, first of all. So the three years after an Experiment in Love, 1995. This was when The Giant O'Brien was published. So we would say perhaps that that was a contemporary novel, even though in some ways it's historic in other ways. What followed after The Giant O'Brien, of course, was Beyond Black in 2005. And in many respects, that's seen as Mantel's breakthrough novel. Um, so it was much more successful, but it was also much longer than The Giant O'Brien. And I'm wondering if we could think about it perhaps slightly retroactively. So bear with me for a moment because I'm going to introduce that and then I'm going to contradict it. So I'd like to begin by thinking about it retroactively because Mantel herself has thought about the Tudor books retroactively. So she's thought about Beyond Black as quote, a vast preparatory project for the Tudor books. And this was something I published in my interview with her some years ago. 
So I thought this was quite an interesting way of beginning to think about the giant O'Brien. If we think about Beyond Black as the beginning of the Tudor books, could we think about the giant O'Brien as the beginning of Beyond Black? And there are thematic connections. It's almost as if she gets to the point where she wants to examine death by the end of the giant O'Brien, and then she explores the afterlife in Beyond Black. So we could perhaps consider a retroactive reading of Mantell as historical novel novelist and see the origins of the Tudor books in Beyond Black and the origins of Beyond Black in novels like Every Day is Mother's Day, which of course also involves a medium. And perhaps the giant in The Giant O'Brien is perhaps a medium figure. But why do we overlook The Giant O'Brien? Those of you who have read my work, including the monograph that David very kindly mentioned, will know that I am far from being a fan of the origin myth. So this is why I've introduced this idea only to debunk it. But what I'm interested in is what is actually elided, evaded, or simply ignored. And I think that this book actually falls into that category. I'm as guilty of this as anyone else, I think, when it comes to the giant Brian, and I'm happy to be contradicted. I've not included it in any detail in my own monograph on Mantel's writing. I've not included it in the collection of essays that I co-edited with Lucy. So I'm quite interested in why this novel hasn't received attention because there is a great deal more that I could have said in this 20 minutes than I am able to. So for those people who aren't familiar with the novel, this is a summary. So set in London, 1782, Charles O'Brien, Bard and Giant arrives from Ireland to seek his fortune. A freak of nature, he has a poet's soul. His opposite is a man of science, John Hunter, celebrated surgeon and famed anatomist. He buys dead men from the gallows and babies' corpses by the inch. Classic Mantel, that there. And he wants the giant's bones. Brilliant, lyrical, shocking and spliced with black comedy, The Giant of Brian is an unforgettable novel in which belief wrestles knowledge and science wrestles song. So I thought that that was a very interesting place to start, this idea of it being an unforgettable novel, which sadly none of us really have written about. The summary on the back matter of this 2010 post first Booker edition, and I think that's quite important in terms of thinking about Mantel and how she is now marketed. Charles O'Brien is actually a fictionalized version of Charles Byrne. So the dates for Byrne are 1761 to 1783, known as the Irish giant. That is a term that was used at the time. And it's reflected in the novel in that he is frequently referred to as the giant and the giant uh, with a capital G. So if I use that language, I'm using it from the novel. John Hunter likewise was a real person. He was a Scottish surgeon and he appears as himself. And I think he's actually very much reminiscent of Thomas More in Wolf Hall. I'd be interested to see what other people think. So he's a distinguished surgeon and scientist, but here he's portrayed as absolutely monstrous in all kinds of ways, unable to self-reflect. Um, and preoccupied by a very particular set of questions and goals. As Mantell has pointed out, the hunter of the novel seeks an answer to an impossible question. So he is the classic antagonist in that respect. This is a direct quote from the PS section at the back of The Giant O'Brien. He is preoccupied, says Mantell, with the question of the weight of the soul and what happens to it on the point of death. So going back to my earlier point, this idea of um, going to the border is something that is in the novel explicitly, but she doesn't go beyond, neither does Hunter, et cetera. So in this respect, this idea of a preoccupation with a question that can't be answered, I think he's got something of the Captain Ahabs about him, which is perhaps why Walter Kendrick slightly unkindly described him in his New York Times review as ludicrous. And that's a direct quote. So you'll know from having looked at the novel, if you've, if you've had a chance to, that this novel received quite mixed reviews. Not all of them were as unkind as Kendrick. Mantell has written about the book in an interesting way. And as everybody here who's spent time on Mantel will know, she's often the most insightful reader of her own work. So forgive this long quotation, but I think it gives a great deal of insight into 
uh, what I hope to look at next. So here she says that in a way I feel more than any other book that I have absolutely no responsibility for what I put on the page in The Giant O'Brien. When I first came across a reference to the story of the real 18th century giant Charles O'Brien, that's how she refers to him, despite him being known as a, uh, under a different name, I imagined that I would write a big, realistic, historical novel about John Hunter, the great surgeon, collector and experimentalist who acquired his skeleton for research. Yet when I sat down to write, something completely different happened. I heard the voices of the men in the cave. Suddenly I remembered I was Irish. Below the language I was speaking, there was another language, a language that had been lost. So the novel became about the giant, utterly. It was as if something came into the room, opened its mouth and sang. I just wrote the song out and it was over. So I think there are a number of things here that hopefully we can pick up on in discussion. Um, but the idea that she was going to write a big realistic historical novel, I think is really interesting. The emphasis on the lost language and the relationship to identity. But I think also this idea of something coming into the room is very familiar to people who've spent time listening to Mantel talk about her Tudor books. I think that this introduces quite nicely one of the key elements of the novel, which is defamiliarization. And I think that we could probably all agree that these elements are present in all of Mantel's work, but I think they are particularly present in this novel. Therefore, I will use the rest of the paper to argue that it is the many and conflicting elements of defamiliarization in this novel, which are so familiar, if you'll pardon the expression, to Mantel's early work, especially, and indeed her short stories, that have perhaps led to the neglect of this novel in the scholarship. So this is my argument for today's paper. So here are some of the mixture of views. Famously, John Bailey wrote about it in the New York Times Review of Books. And I think that this is an interesting quote. I'm not going to read all of it for the sake of time, but he emphasizes the poetics of the language. So it's interesting what Mantel has said about language and her trying to regain a lost language that's not regainable. He talks about it being a brilliant pastiche, specifically of Swift and Joyce deploying all the tricks of understatement, which is true, and there is an awful lot of humour in the novel as well. He draws upon the work of Slavsky. So I'm thinking here, particularly of the essay artist technique, the making strange. And he goes on to talk about her reanimating, which is a word that's become very associated with Mantel, particularly through her uh, reflexes her approach to historical fiction. And he talks about her style as acute and her arresting vision of history. So I think we can all see the seeds of things that percolated later in that quite insightful review. Um, forgive me for slightly laughing at the novel in the way it was described elsewhere as lyrical, disturbing, grievous, magical, stinking, complex, magnanimous, dark and strange. So mixed reviews, I would say, on balance. It is a shocking and violent novel. It is uncomfortable. It ends with a note that is a slap in the face reality check. It makes you feel every bit the voyeur you are. This is the ending. This is her note to you, her final, um, her final, uh, her final moment. She says, the bones of Charles Byrne, so this is the real man, may be inspected during the usual exhibition hours at the Museum of the Royal College of Surgeons, Lincoln's Inn Fields, London. That's the end of the book. It might interest you to know that the Hunterian Museum is currently closed and during this period of closure, the trustees will consider releasing Burns' skeleton for burial. So I think there is a deep political message there. Moving on, a conscious of time, I'm going to touch upon the different ways in which the novel defamiliarizes. It does so through the grotesque, which is not unusual for Mantel. So here we have a figure that is described, and I won't read the whole quotation. It's described as a hybrid, and it has um, elements of the composite, which is a, re a recurring trope in Mantel's work. 
Interestingly, and you'll see here, the giant is referred to as the giant capital G. He's the only one who sees it. So there is something going on there, I think, in terms of perspective, which I'll pick up on later. There's an idea of this sort of insight being associated with the Irish and with Irish identity. You'll note the English don't have werewolves. For the English, you're either one thing or the other. There are more of these grotesques in Mantel's short stories, and I have written about that elsewhere. But I'd like to move on to other forms of defamiliarization, particularly in terms of the dead, which I think is useful for thinking about the Tudor books. So this is actually from the perspective of John Hunter, and there is a dichotomy in the novel in relation to an idea of the spiritual through the giant and an idea of the rational through John Hunter and the rational definitely loses. But even here, John is saying it's easily to be confused about the living and the dead. This is a, a sentence very reminiscent of what happens in the Tudor books. If you look at that top quotation, he's talking about his younger brother who's dead um, and also called John. And it, it goes on to say, I say this because though in most cases the dead and the living are quite unalike, there are special circumstances when it is difficult to distinguish one from the other. This is brought up later as well in the novel. Um, and this is the whole question around the soul. Um, again, this is focalized from the point of view of Hunter. There is a difference in the language between the giant and Hunter but they're focalized in a way that is highly reminiscent of what happens in the Tudor books. It's not first person, it's very much third person, but there is a distinct shift in register. There's a difference in focus from the unquantifiable with the giant to the very much quantifiable, from meaning to merely value. There are two more slides that I'd like to share with you. I'm conscious of time. There is also defamiliarization in the novel via the unseen. Again, it would be very, very familiar to people who have read more of Mantel's work that this is something she comes back to again and again. There's an opposition between broadly Irish folklore and storytelling and English empiricism and control. One of my questions, which I think would be interesting to talk about if we have time, is whether or not that dichotomy actually works in the novel. Um, I'm wondering if that might be one of the reasons that the scholarship hasn't emphasised this book. That's just my view. Um, the mentioning of the edible house is one of the more concrete references to particular forms of Irish storytelling in that top bullet point. But there's another here that is, I think, a very classically Mantell statement, ventriloquized here by the giant in the second bullet point. The lesson is not about believing that things may be, the lesson is not about beasts, sorry, but the lesson is about believing that things may be invisible, but still exist. And then we have that final link there to um, Greek mythology and the lotus eaters. So there's a great deal going on in terms of connections with various forms of the unseen. But my final side is to do with the body, which you might wonder why I've left to the, to the end, but I think it's partly because it's, it's so significant. Defamiliarization via the body is most evident in terms of the giant's experience of both embodiment and feeling. He's frequently described as a figure who feels too much. But we also have that by a hunter. And the reason I've included this whole quotation is I feel it could be Thomas Cromwell, in particular in relation to his illness and his recovery uh, from that illness. You'll note that his family doesn't recover from the illness. But Hunter here is talking about after 10 days, he's out of bed, leaning on an arm. He claims kinship with his feet. He knows intellectually they belong to him. And he accepts that he has returned to his true size, that the fire isn't burning purple. And then finally, and I love this line, his hands swim in dislocated space. It's as if something's gone inside, as if his spring were broken. So again, I've already drawn attention to this idea of focalization and narrative perspective, which I think we can see 
clearer experimentation with through Thomas Cromwell in the Tudor books, although it's well documented, the response to Wolf Hall in relation to that. But that metonymy at the end with the hands, I think is really reminiscent of Miss Dempsey in Flood as well. So that's something that I've spent quite a lot of time on recently. Um, so I thought that that was an interesting connection as well. But my feeling is that there's just too much, too much defamiliarization. My overall conclusion really was that no other Mantel novel Certainly no other Mantel historical novel actually contains as much defamiliarization and as many defamiliarizing features at the same time. If one or two defamiliarizing features are present in other works, such as the blurring of the line between the dead and the living in Flood, for example, then there is always a stabilizing aspect. So in Flood, there is a realist setting and it's conveyed through a grounded description. It's not lyrical language. We have lyrical language as well in The Giant O'Brien. It's difficult rereading and examining The Giant O'Brien, I discovered, to come to any firm conclusion as to what the reader can ultimately have purchase on in the novel. And this is something that I've spent quite a lot of time thinking about in terms of Mantel, that you need to have some sense of purchase and it can be, it can be very difficult. I think in this one in particular, Time frame, setting, character, language, theme, structure, they're all unstable. And I suspect that's partly why there's a gap in the scholarship. Thank you so much, Eileen, for that absolutely fabulous uh, presentation. I am burning to ask a question, but like everyone else, I will uh, uh, put my questions in the Q&A chat box and we can deal with them at the end of all three papers. So a reminder that uh, uh, you can do that at any point and we'll return after um, all our panelists have had an opportunity to speak. So thanks again, Eileen, for that fabulous presentation. Now I'll invite uh, Terry to present to us on a Middle Eastern Jane Eyre. Terry. Um, hi, I, I regret after seeing um, the slideshows, some of the, especially some of the beautiful imagery in the slides. Um, I, I kind of regret not having a slideshow to show you, uh, but um, nevertheless, I will jump in. So Hilary Mantel has written exclusively on the four years she spent in Saudi Arabia with her husband in the early 1980s, revealing that only after leaving the kingdom did she recognize how much living in the kingdom contributed to her, quote, inner impoverishment, end quote. Just two years after she and her husband had left the kingdom, 1988, Mantel published Eight Months on Gaza Street, an exploration of a woman's experience of a special kind of oppression in 1980s Saudi Arabia. Whereas Mantel reveals in a 2015 interview with the Paris Review that she felt that there, quote, are a lot of problems with that novel, end quote, and admits to her own, quote, inexperience, end quote, when writing the novel. She also reveals that during her creative process, she relied on the diaries and notes she kept while living in the kingdom. Perhaps this inexperience of which Mantel speaks led the author to consider what Adrian Rich calls, quote, revision, the act of looking back, of seeing with fresh eyes, of entering an old text from a new critical direction, end quote. Sandra M. Gilbert and Susan Gubar in their groundbreaking 1979, The Mad Woman in the Attic, suggests that such revision would, quote, begin by actively seeking a female literary per precursor who proves by example that a revolt against patriarchal literary authority is possible, end quote, as evidenced by the work of, among others that uh, Gilbert and Gubar explored, it is Mantel's engagement with female precursors like Bronte that results in what Lucy Arnold calls a, quote, a problematic comparison, end quote, of eight months in Gaza Street uh, with Henry James's turn of the screw due to the presence of, quote, political specters, end quote, as Arnold argues, but no ghosts in Mantel's novel. And I'd just like to add here, I found it was interesting that Eileen drew attention to how John Bailey compares the giant O'Brien to Swift and Joyce, again, two male authors. Instead, 
Eight Months demonstrates the influence of not only Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, but also Charlotte Perkins, Perkins Gilman's The Yellow Wallpaper, only, quote, revolting against patriarchal literary authorities, end quote, like Henry James, but also against the oppressive patriarchal societies in which these authors found themselves. These narrative choices Mantel makes in Eight Months on Gaza Street not only connect the novel to female precursors who expose how oppressive patriarchies like Saudi Arabia political specters, but also accuses the US and the UK, often smug in their support of women's equality, of collaborating with a, the oppressive Saudi Arabian regime. In a column in Elle magazine that coincided with Wolf Hall opening on Broadway, Hilary Mantel reveals that her mother had told her at nine that she was too young, end quote, to read Jane Eyre, inspiring the young Mantel to read it anyway. She describes it as one of the works of literature that had a great influence on her because it, quote, is a big book from women who are going to become writers because Jane is an observer. So you feel you're reading about yourself for the first time, end quote. This much loved story of a young orphan woman, teacher and then a governess has its romantic hero, Edward Fairfax Rochester. In Bronte's novel, Jane thinks of and calls this character Rochester, but Rochester's brother-in-law, Richard Mason, calls him Fairfax. Rochester courts Jane and asks her to marry him, but Jane must flee when she discovers he's already married, finding sanctuary with the Marsh End and meeting a man who is the antithesis, I'm sorry, antithesis of Rochester, helping Jane reaffirm her love for Rochester. After her experiences at Marsh End and her windfall of inheritance, Jane returns to find Thornfield Hall destroyed by fire. In his attempt to save his wife from that fire, one his wife is set, Rochester ascended to the skylight and on to the roof, end quote. Bertha Mason died anyway, and Rochester is injured by falling debris, blinding him and crushing his hand. Gilbert and Gubar argue that these injuries emasculate Rochester, rendering him reliant on Jane as though he were as helpless as a child. Fairfax is a character in Mantell's novel as well, marked as a romantic by his gift to Francis of a bou quote, bouquet of white roses, end quote. His thoughtful recitation of a line from a Robert's Graves, Robert Graves poem and his admission to overvaluing women. Frances's narrative in eight months opens with her international flight from the UK to Saudi Arabia. A businessman near her seat mentions a colleague by the name of Fairfax, who had apparently been posted to a suburb of Hong Kong, then still a colonial outpost of the UK. Fairfax is described as so lacking in credibility that, quote, they treat him like some bit of a kid, end quote. It isn't until toward the end of the novel that Fairfax appears again, arriving late at the shore's flat with the roses. Then Fairfax introduces the story he has heard about Jeff Pollard's affair with another man's wife. He recites the opening of Graves's A Slice of Wedding Cake and issues an assessment of Pollard that matches Francis's own. Quote, I've seen better things than Jeff in the reptile, reptile house, end quote. When Francis asks, about the rest of the poem, Fairfax nicely summarizes the poem, adding that the poet wonders, quote, whether he overvalues women, end quote. When Francis asks if Fairfax overvalues women, he admits he does. And a lot of poems, quote, for an air conditioning expert, end quote. Francis makes the assessment that Fairfax will not last in Jeddah because it is, quote, no place for men who like women, end quote. Andrew interferes in this little tete a tete defending his male colleagues by saying, quote, we're not all like the Saudis, end quote. Francis goes on the offensive, arguing that they, quote, seem to collaborate with them, end quote. Reflecting after saying this, that she, quote, had not thought she, known she thought it until she heard it pop out of her mouth. Much of what constitutes the mystery at the center of this novel, eight months, 
and the suspicions of illicit transactions occurring above the Shores' apartment is revealed on the roof of the Shores' apartment block, which, like the roof of Thornfield, is a place for viewing the lay of the land, but also a place of horror. Shortly after her arrival in Jeddah, Frances goes up to the roof of the apartment block where she discovers long views over the dusty street, over the big turquoise rubbish, rubbish skips, over the rows of parked cars. Fierce cats spit and howl and limp in the purlieus of the building." End quote. On another visit, she goes up to the roof to, quote, look out over the city, end quote. Frances reflects on how she, quote, liked the roof at first, this privileged and private view, end quote. It is during one of her roof visits that she spies, quote, a wooden crate, end quote, on the balcony of the empty flat that is located above her own flat. What is in the crate becomes Frances' obsession. In Bronte's novel, Jane is led to the roof of Thornfield Hall when Mrs. Fairfax is giving Jane a tour. From that flat lead roof, Jane, quote, surveys the grounds laid out like the bright and velvet lawn closely girdling the gray base of the mansion, end quote. Later, Jane climbs to the roof where she, quote, looks out afar over sequestered field and hill and a long dim skyline, end quote. While Jane's initial view has order and beauty, Frances's initial view is of garbage and feral cats. However, Thornfield's roof is the site of Bertha Mason's death and precipitates the maiming of Rochester. The apartment block's roof is the site of Fairfax's shock and fear that precipitate his attempted escape to the airport and his death. During Fairfax that precedes this tragedy, Fairfax and the Shores drink too much homemade wine. Fairfax passes out on the couch and the Shores retire. Sometime in the early morning, Fairfax encounters something on the roof that terrifies him. Francis and Andrew find him in the stairwell, lead him back inside, and Fairfax nods off to sleep again. It is the last time they see him because, they discover later, Fairfax tries to make it to the airport and, and escape the kingdom, but dies on the way. Francis is left wondering exactly what Fairfax saw on the roof and how it might have been related to the mysterious crate that she had seen on the balcony of the vacant flat above them, and if Fairfax was murdered. Returning to the criticism that Francis makes of her husband and his colleagues, Mantel's choice of this word collaborate in the scene of Fairfax's arrival is an interesting one, given Mantel's birth in Northern England in 1952 where she would have grown up in a society for which collaborator is someone, quote, who collaborates with the enemy. Mantel describes the society in which she grew up in as a post-war society that was both anxious and complacent. Anxious because the struggle since 1939 had been so hard, complacent because, as her elders would have put it, England had won again, England had not been invaded, end quote. While Mantel's reminiscence supports the understanding of a collaborator to mean something sinister in the years she grew up in England, it has been part of a media storm around Boris Johnson, having called, quote, MPs who passed the act forbidding a no-deal Brexit collaborators, end quote. Guardian columnist Stephen Poole reminds his readers and Johnson that collaboration has, since 1940, been defined by the OED as, quote, traitorous cooperation with the enemy, end quote. Francis's accusation of Andrew and his male colleagues as, quote, seeming to collaborate with the Saudis suggests that the Saudis are the enemy, end quote, and that Mantel is criticizing the West's collaboration with the Saudi regime. If Jane's anger and criticism are directed at Victorian society's concept of marriage, as Gilbert and Gubar argue, then Francis's anger and criticism are directed at the collaboration between the United Kingdom and Saudi Arabia, and the United Kingdom and Saudi Arabia. This partition, participation of the UK with the Saudi company, sorry, economy, is demonstrated by the presence of Turadep, William, and Shaper, the company that hires Andrew Shore, and the company of expats. The participation of the US in the Saudi economy is demonstrated by the American-made model of the building that Andrew's working on and the Shores' American friends, Carla and Ricky Zussman. But does doing business with the kingdom equate with collaborating with the kingdom? In her exploration of sex and social justice, Martha C. Nussbaum criticizes the international community because the world, quote, 
worldwide mobilization against South African apartheid was not accompanied by any similar mobilization to divest stockholdings in nations that treat women as unequal under the law. In eight months, Antel compares the situation of women in Saudi Arabia to those who suffered under apartheid in South Africa. In her nonfiction writing, she makes the comparison explicit. Andrew tells Francis shortly after she arrives, the people, especially women, are not free, quote, just to move around as you like, end quote. Francis says that it reminds her of the, quote, pass laws, end quote, the South African system that controlled the movement of its diverse population. Throughout the novel, Francis's movements are both controlled, criticized, and erased, from inappropriate language from the drivers of cars to cars trying to run her over, in avoidance by Saudi Arabian males to make contact with Francis or answer any of her questions, rendering her invisible. By accusing Andrew and the men of his company, and by extension, the men of the companies that work with them, of being collaborators, Mantel, through Francis, is accusing these men, their companies, and their countries for neglecting to raise against Saudi Arabia the kind of, quote, intense public concern and condemnation that other systematic atrocities against groups often receive, end quote. Nussbaum argues that liberal respect for religious difference is involved in this neglect. I have a little bit more here. Um, I'll try to get through uh, just the uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman um, analysis who is also an influence on Mantel's novel, as seen when, just prior to Fairfax's arrival, Francis discovers that the landlord's workers are, quote, preparing to line the stairwell with pattern tiles with a whirling pattern of black, white, and red, end quote. The application of the tiles, five minutes, okay. The application of the tiles is not yet complete, but Francis is assailed with horror anticipating that when the tiles, quote, met in the middle, the effect would be hellish, end quote. She stops, quote, to consider the pattern, small faces, like each tile with its splash of scarlet, its swirl of black. She felt as if she were being watched by bloodied eyes by the victims of some Quranic punishment. And soon the men would start work again and the watchers would multiply, end quote. These hellish tiles suggest Perkins Gilsman's much anthologized short story, the yellow wallpaper. After Fairfax's death, quote, the tiles look down from the walls, each with its hostile aisle and signal, signal scarlet tear, end quote. This is significant because during Perkins Gilman's protagonist, a bedroom of a colonial mansion, she describes the wallpaper as, quote, spra sprawling flamboyant patterns committing every artistic sin, a smoldering unclean yellow, end quote. End quote. Later, she detects a woman behind the bars of the paper struggling to get out. The narrator tears off the wallpaper, thinking that she is freeing the woman trapped behind those bars. When she finds more wallpaper over her bed, she sees them at this as, quote, all those strangled heads and bulbous eyes shrieking with derision, end quote. In the end, she has torn off all the wallpaper so that her husband cannot put her back into the wallpaper. The rest cure her hus doctor husband prescribed for her an approach to men, women's mental illness developed in the US that confines women to their so-called natural behavior of inactivity and decorum served only to worsen her mental health. Mantel's eight months, like both Perkins Gilman's short story and Bronte's novel, explore the effects of madness in women's on women oppressed by the patriarchy. The unnamed narrator in the yellow wallpaper is demonstrating some signs of mental illness at the beginning of the story but by its conclusion has fallen into madness as demonstrated by her fear of being put back into the wallpaper. Jane is also exposed to madness, both in the form of Bertha Mason and as Gilbert and Gubar describe during her episode in the Red Room, her species of fit, um, she must choose between the crossroads of, quote, the escape through flight or escape through starvation or escape through madness, end quote. They suggest that, quote, mad Bertha is, quote, in a sense, her own secret self, end quote. And that, quote, on a figurative and psychological level, it seems suspiciously clear that the specter of Bertha, end quote, is an avatar of Jane. In Mantel's novel, Francis's tete a tete with Fairfax suggests that they are equals, whereas Andrew's oppression of France, Francis increases the longer they stay in Saudi Arabia. 
whereas Francis is bothered by the sounds emanating from the vacant apartment above them. Um, Andrew tells her she asks, quote, too many questions. When she quizzes him again about the roof, Andrew gets angry and condescend condescendingly asks, quote, what is it, Fran? Have you finished your detective story? Do you want to go up to the library tonight? End quote. After Fairfax's disappearance and death, Francis and Andrew try to locate and identify Fairfax's body in a runaround that is reminiscent of Perkins Gilman's unnamed narrator tearing down the wallpaper in her room, trying to find and release the body of the woman trapped inside. In the last short chapter of eight months, Mantel chooses a first person point of view narrative like Perkin Gilman, Perkins Gilman. Francis describes the new house that she and Andrew have moved into, comparing the quote, grayish vinyl tiles, end quote, of its floor to those, quote, used in a sanitarium, end quote. From the main windows, she can only see, quote, the plain slab walls of the neighboring houses, end quote, with a freeway in the distance. She recalls that when they first came, quote, here, all the furniture was arranged around the outside of the room, as if in some entertainment was to take place, end quote, or like the chairs arranged in a doctor's office, or an admitting room in a sanatorium. Francis is reduced to such a state that she can't, quote, seem to make an impact on the dirt, end quote, thinking that perhaps she's, quote, using the wrong cleaning materials. When she steps out on onto outside, uh, she feels that she's whited out. Her reflection in the glass patio doors is black, quote, deeply shadowed, eyes and a pale ragged aureole encircles my head. I have become the negative of myself. Francis returns to the interior to look out of the windows. Her months spent in Saudi Arabia have contributed to Francis' inner impoverishment, equating Francis with Bertha Mason and the unnamed narrator confined to patriarchy for her madness. Thank you. Thank you so much, Terry, for that great paper and uh, absolutely precisely on time as well. So. Uh... <laughs> Well, wonderfully, <laughs> wonderfully done. Um, and again, any questions, please do remember to, to drop them in the Q&A box for when uh, our third talk is completed. And now it's uh, my pleasure to invite uh, Lucy, our uh, other co-convener of this conference, to talk about nightmares about fossils, spectral children, and intergenerational trauma in the works of Hilary Mantel. Lucy. So I wanted to start this paper with two, to my mind, kind of interlocking quotations. And the first one is actually taken from the interview between Eileen Pollard and Hilary Mantel, published in Textual Practice. And here Mantel's speaking about um, the, the inspirations for her protagonists in her novel, An Experiment in Love. And she says of those children, they were haunted by their parents' pasts. They couldn't even put a name to those ghosts. The second is an extract from Mantel's 1994 novel, A Change of Climate, and it describes its protagonist's childhood encounter with a fossil. I'm just gonna read it because it's quite key to my paper. A sharp pang of delight took hold of him, a feeling that was for a moment indistinguishable from fear. He had picked up a fossil, a ridged grey-green curl, glassy and damp like a descending wave. It lay in his palm two inches across, an inch and a half at its crest. Here was its soft body inside this shell, with its heart and blood vessels and gills. When it died, all those soft parts rotted and the sand filled up the cavity, and then the sand compacted and turned into rock. So both those quotations, to my mind, are concerned with children experiencing this uncanny persistence of a seemingly unknowable past within the present. They're concerned with how the shape of an absence might be delineated within familial and geological histories. And in doing so, they gesture towards my area of exploration today in this paper, and that is the nightmares about fossils which are incubated by unnameable spectres of personal, national and global pasts, spectres which are frequently in Hilary Mantel's, excuse me, in Hilary Mantel's work, um, those of children. So this paper was originally envisaged in the child spectres across Mantel's work to date. And I've given you some of those examples on the slide here. Um, in fact, including the, um, the same quotation about the hound or babby that Eileen used. Um, great minds think alike, clearly. Um, but um, in this shorter paper, I'll be examining just one um, instance of Mantel's use of this motif. And I think for me, it's rendered particularly interesting by its post-colonial implications. I think the post-colonial possibilities of Mantel's writing remain, in my opinion, really underexplored. 
Um, but today I'm simply going to be talking about the spectral child in A Change of Climate. So for those of you that have not had the pleasure of reading the novel, um, A Change of Climate is a family drama which traces three generations of the Eldred family with a primary focus on the husband and wife um, couple, Anna and Ralph Eldred. Shortly after their marriage, Anna and Ralph are sent to apartheid South Africa to undertake missionary work. And while there, they come into conflict with the apartheid regime and they're briefly jailed. When they're released from jail, they take up a new posting um, in the Beshwana Land Protectorate, which is now Botswana. And there, Anna gives birth to twins, a boy, Matthew, and a girl, Kit. And a few months after their birth, both babies are abducted. And though Kit is recovered, um, Matthew is never found. And it is suspected that his kidnapping has been orchestrated to uh, facilitate a muti or ritual medicine murder. Um, so the family return to Norfolk, where they continue their charitable work, and they go on to have a further three children, Julian, Robin and Rebecca. However, Matthew is never mentioned. His existence and his disappearance are a closely guarded family secret. And the narrative really centres around how the Eldred's lives begin to break down in the face of the pressure that this horrifying secret exerts on them. So through unpacking the significance of the multitude of missing children in a change of climate who register in the text like Ralph's fossil as kind of insistently present absences, which I term spectral, I propose a reading of these children as inscribing the presence of intergenerational traumas, not only on a familial level, but on a national and international scale. So I'll be conducting this reading in the context of Derrida's conceptualization of how we might relate to the spectre, the political and ethical possibilities inherent in that relationship as he puts forward in Spectres of Marx. But I want to put that into conversation with Nicholas Abram and Maria Torek's psychoanalytic concept of the phantom and the crypt. And that's a critical conjunction that I hope will allow us to move a bit more easily between the intrapsychic and the international. So to begin then, let's return to that fossil. As my title implies, the fossils in the text, and Ralph goes on to become a keen fossil hunter, he builds up a significant collection, they act in the novel as an unsettling force. Ralph's delight, which is indistinguishable from fear, manifests in a number of Ralph's children in profound anxiety. For these children, born after Matthew's disappearance, the present absence of the fossils is nightmarish. Mantel's use of language in the um, extract on the slide here provides an insight into why these seemingly innocuous objects have this effect on the children. Julian's peculiar horror is underscored by its ambivalence. The fossils frighten him both in their status as broken traces, indications that something has happened, but not necessarily that something is, and in their dead and goneness. They are frightening because they both insistently try to communicate as traces and because they emphasize the irrevocable nature of death, its obliteration of presence. The fossils are not just dead, they are dead and gone. Um, their absence is grammatically harnessed to their deadness. So the nightmares about fossils, their peculiar horror, is just one element of a constellation of strange compulsions and behaviours exhibited by the Eldred children, but particularly Julian, and I've described those on the slide here. The two examples that I've given articulate an anxiety about and play with absence and presence, the visible and the invisible, the knowable and the unknowable. However, once Julian hits adulthood, a new compulsive behaviour emerges in his anxiety over the possibility of his younger sister, Rebecca, being abducted and his kind of compulsive research into children that have disappeared in the locality. Now, really fascinatingly, and as we might expect from an author who places such emphasis on what the historical record can and cannot provide, all of the references that Julian makes in this passage are to historical unsolved missing child cases. Um, and just you do a little bit of digging and you can, you can find these original cases. It's striking that this description of Julian's behavior is given in the context of it being inexplicable to his parents and to his siblings and indeed to himself. As his mother puts it, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say to you, Julian. While Julian says of his anxiety, I can't explain it to you any more than I have. However, when read in light of Abraham and Torek's notion of the phantom and the crypt, the significance becomes clearer. Abraham and Torek were psychoanalysts and theorists, and they argue that certain kinds of losses, whether emerging out of bereavement or other trauma, are so catastrophic as to be inadmissible to knowledge. So this means that the normal process of mourning fails, and instead the result is the formation of an intrapsychic crypt. 
As Esther Perrin puts it, such failure transpires when the healthy process of introduction, where the self expands itself by assimilating or working through its own desires as well as external objects and events, is unsuccessful. And incorporation, where the self takes the object into itself, whole, sort of swallows it whole, as it were, preserves it as a secret never to be revealed, occurs. However, this secret tomb is never fully sealed off, according to these theorists, and its contents find ways to make itself manifest, as Abraham and Torek describe. They say sometimes in the dead of night, when libidinal fulfillments have their way, the ghost of the crypt comes back to haunt the cemetery guard, giving him strange, incomprehensible signals, making him perform bizarre acts or subjecting him to unexpected sensations. Torek goes on to point out how, like a commemorative monument, the incorporated object betokens the place, the date, the circumstances in which desires were banished from introjection. They stand like tombs in the life of the ego. Mantel's representation of Anna and Ralph's experience of their loss and the stuckness that the secrecy around their son's abduction institutes resonates powerfully with this model. As Ralph puts it, when his son tries to ask him about his experience in South Africa, he replies, all that part of our lives, we prefer to forget it, Anna and me, it's, we've closed the door on it. So for me, that dash is so important in the way that Matthew's loss kind of insistently emerges in this text, even and especially when the character's language acts attempt to just completely erase him. Interestingly, Julian is only able to move towards a kind of letting go of the compulsions that give the Phantom of Matthew house room after his girlfriend takes him and shows him a, a monument to another dead child. So Francis Hibgame, who is mentioned in the novel, becomes another spectral child who is reanimated in this narrative. As you can see from the other image on the slide, that's an entry from Debrett's The Peerage of the United Kingdom. Francis was a real person and the memorial Mantel adverts to is also real and located in Burnham Norton Church in Norfolk. So the crypt need not only form in the psyche of the individual or individuals who have undergone a loss. And indeed, Abraham and Torek also theorize the concept of the phantom a figure of intergenerational haunting, which indicates, as Rand puts it, an undisclosed family secret handed down to an unwitting descendant. Now, intergenerational trauma was originally theorized in relation to the children of Holocaust survivors, many of whom displayed the kinds of incomprehensible um, signals and bizarre compulsive behaviors, which Abraham and Torah point to. And it's this kind of phantom that Matthew forms in the text, where his siblings seem to sense his absence without knowing of his existence. As Kit Matthew's twin asks, do you think your body has memories that your mind doesn't have access to? What happens if we read Julian's behaviour in light of these ideas of the crypt and the intergenerational phantom? Julian's behaviour offers an articulation of the experience of intergenerational trauma, as Julian is unwittingly um, being compelled to act by traumatic knowledge he doesn't really know he possesses. Such a reading also compels us to read Julian's behaviour as articulating something meaningful. The erasing and rewriting he takes part in as a small boy speaks to this idea. Um, the erasing and rewriting he takes part in as a small boy speaks to this idea, graphically enacting his mother's traumatic replaying of the night Matthew was taken, trying to reverse the sequence of events and avoid them happening. Likewise, his drawing of the tree with its association with the family tree, the idea of heredity, complete with its subterranean components, offers a recognition that the Eldred family has grown up around a repudiated absence, which Julian's drawing obliquely tries to return to knowledge. The encrypting of Matthew's disappearance is also carried out formally in Mantel's text. Early in the novel, Ralph's sister Emma visits a shrine at Walsingham, where she adds an entry to the Book of Remembrance. This absence that Emma leaves, you can see it on the slide here, is perplexing on first reading, and its significance is only fully registered in the text's final pages when she returns to the shrine. And she's kind of reinterpreted into this memorial. 
the importance of that final sentence, I argue, is the way that it tracks this erasure of Matthew as inscribed in the use of dashes throughout the novel through to this memorialization, which marks the beginning of a different process of mourning for this lost child. Now, this is by no means a straightforward process. So in the preceding paragraph, Emma struggles to find a pen to write in the Book of Remembrance. The fountain pen she's looking for has been lost or taken. The pen that she actually finds is a really rubbish one. It's furred, leaking, it's ink is silted and initially the pen doesn't work at all and only succeeds in creating this inscription of absence again. So we encounter here an image of a struggle to open the crypt to bring into the realm of knowledge the spectral child described in the novel as a shadow life the opposite of flesh. However the penultimate lines of the book along with the idea that um, an anonymous child has borrowed Emma's good pen, points us to a wider set of implications for the spectral children in this narrative. Once Emma has written Matthew's name in the Book of Remembrance, she leaves her pen behind on the basis that you could not know what desperate soul would come along with no means of writing at all. So for me, this anticipation of the subject who has no means of writing their story, no means of being placed within the realm of knowledge, as Matthew eventually is, acknowledges the wealth of other missing children in this narrative, not merely the cases that disturb Julian so much, but crucially the Black South African children that Anna and Ralph encounter on their first missionary placement, and the countless, quote, and uncountable Botswanan children who are taken or disappear into the bush every year. Mantel has become known in recent years, as we all are aware, as a historical novelist, and it's worth attending to the fact that all of Mantel's work, not merely her Tudor books, display a profoundly historicist sensibility. In A Change of Climate, this is articulated in Mantel's kind of registering of how Protestant missionary work in apartheid South Africa, which was responsible for much of the health and education provision there, frequently ran in a directly contradictory direction to government policy and the legal system. As Richard Elphick uh, points out, the South African government, loath to tax its white electorate to pay for services to blacks, was happy to subcontract such services. However, the majority of English-speaking missionaries, as Elphick points out, had much more liberal social and political views than the majority of white settlers. Now, with the election of the nationalist government in 1948, the perceived liberal approach of mission schools in particular was considered not to be in line with the apartheid regime, and the government took control of the majority of mission schools, a move solidified by the passing of the Bantu Education Act in 1953. Mantel's fictionalised Archbishop of Cape Town, closely based on Geoffrey Clayton, the Archbishop there between 48 and 57, voices the implications of the Bantu Education Act to Ralph and Anna when they first visit him. But it's Ralph's response to this which is of interest here. Ralph states of the Act, it seems to cut off all hope for the future. You can repeal other laws, but how will you undo the effects of this one? And as the Archbishop muses two pages later, the children feel they have that, that their futures have been taken away. So here is a recognition that a lost future might not simply be inscribed in a missing or dead child, but it might be affected through government policy, that whole generations might be spectralised through colonial intervention. This idea is also present in the police response to the abduction of the Eldred's children, which is that such a crime is, quote, unprecedented. Quote, we have never before in the history of this country recorded the abduction of a white child of two white babies and from their family's compound at night. No, Mrs Eldred, there has been nothing like it. And yet later in a letter Ralph writes to his brother in the wake of Matthew's disappearance, he recalls how the local police don't know how many children are stolen in a year and sold to witch doctors. Sometimes children, older children, wander into the bush. The disappearance is not reported because there is no one to report it to. These children never come back. The Eldred's experience must be read in a context of colonialist and white supremacist attitudes, whereby the disappearance of black children is not, quote, reportable. There is no system for recognising these disappearances, just as the Bantu Education Act institutes a disappearing of the potential of generations of children in South Africa. So I'm just going to conclude now. Um, and as I hope is clear, or as clear as it can be over this rubbish connection, my reading of the text understands Matthew Eldred as one in a constellation of spectral children whose disappearances serve to inscribe trauma at a familial, national and international level. In closing though, I want to think about whether the novel offers us any way to recognise and to live with such spectres in a way which doesn't perpetuate their occlusion or affect their exorcism. Inspectors of Marx, Derrida advocates for a being with spectres. 
a politics of memory, of inheritance and of generations. Pirin glosses the character of the Derrida inspector usefully, and she states that, quote, the spectre's Derrida encourages us to live with comprise divergent collectives of the oppressed and the disempowered. That living with is understood by Derrida as a kind of hospitality to absolute otherness, and it's in this notion of being hospitable to the other that I want to close. So towards the middle of the novel, Mantel introduces us to the character of Melanie. Melanie is a child in care who persistently runs away, has problems with drug use, has a history of self-harm and is known to be violent. And I've given her um, history before she comes to the Eldreds on the slide there. Melanie comes to stay with the Eldreds as an attempt to offer her some normality outside of London to insert her into a family narrative. Now, she is presented as thoroughly unlikable, foul-mouthed, unclean. However, Melanie is also the subject of significant neglect and abandonment. She is a daughter deliberately spectralized by her parents. Now, Melanie runs away from the Eldreds and she ends up in hospital having taken an overdose. And from here, she discharges herself and she somehow manages to make her way back to the Eldreds' home where Anna and Ralph discover her. And this is the account of her discovery. Something moved dog height from one of the rotting sheds. Anna said, what's that? What on earth is it? A creature moved into their view at a distance. It came slowly over the rough ground, crawling. It was a human being, its face a mask of despair, its body half clothed in a flapping gown, its hands and knees and feet bleeding. It progressed towards them. They saw the heaving ribs, the small transparent features, the dirt ingrained skin. We must take her in, Ralph said to Anna, or she will die. Yes, Anna's face was open, astonished. As they approached the child, she stopped she shrank into herself, her head sunk between her shoulder blades like some dying animal. But then as they reached out towards her, Melanie began to breathe painfully, slowly, deeply, sucking in the air as if breathing was something she were learning, as if she had taken a class in it and been taught how to get it right. Melanie's return in an, is in a number of senses a spectral return. She is rendered socially dead by her parents and her treatment by the police and nursing staff who fail to offer any sense of Melanie as a human subject. However, her, re her return into the scene is the return of a creature, an animal. But it's also clear when these two passages are read side by side, the one on the slide here is the return of the infant kit following her abduction, that it's kind of re replaying um, Kit's uh, return also. And finally, in the character's name, Melanie, which is derived from the Greek words for blackness and darkness, is inscribed a return of the trauma inflicted by colonial regimes in South Africa and Botswana, which Ralph and Anna both profoundly oppose and unwittingly abet. The final pages of the novel form a constellation of acknowledgement of all the losses the book inscribes, futures lost to racism and empire, futures lost to inexplicable acts of violence, and futures lost through failures of caregiving on state and parental levels. Anna's yes combines with Emma's reinscription of Matthew's name to offer a model of what the living with ghosts advocated by Derrida might look like, an enactment of his exhortation to live otherwise and better. No, not better, but more justly, but with them. Thank you. Thank Dare you I so turn my camera back on? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think so. I think we'll risk it now. Thank you so much, Lucy, for an absolutely wonderful uh, presentation. Really, really fantastic set of papers there. And I'm sure uh, we'll have lots to talk about. Um, I intend to abuse my um, position as chair at some point, but I won't do it first because that seems um, excessive. So I'll ask, uh, I think Caroline and, and uh, Lucy have sort of similar and related comments that I will um, primarily to Lucy, I suppose, but if anyone else would like to weigh in as well. Um, Caroline was wondering why she hadn't uh, read uh, A Change of Climate and wondered whether or not it was because like most parents, once she had children, she had a horror of something happening to the children and wondered if that was sort of a common experience that that, that people had and perhaps related to that story. And uh, uh, Lucy B. Dutton uh, says that she was very struck in the short story destroyed with a passing reference the moore's murders and given that mantel grew up where those took place and uh, uh, she remembered her parents saying that those events had a significant impact on what wooden would not be permitted uh, for children even years later she was wondering whether or not the local nature of those events might have uh, had some influence on mantel's writings uh, in particular about uh, missing children and then related to to Lucy's paper. Lucy, do you have any thoughts on that? 
I think that's absolutely the case. And I think Mantel talks about this in a number of different kind of pieces of writing, both fictional and, and in her, um, her journalism. What I find quite fascinating is that this, this image of the spectral trial crops up again and again and again. And sometimes it's with that kind of local flavor. And sometimes with a really strange, a strange inflection, there's a short story called Kinsella in his hole, which I think was published, um, it was published in a newspaper rather than kind of, it's not in any anthologies of Mantel's writing, I think possibly because it is kind of too dark to anthologize. And for me, there's an implication there that the two, two of the murderous children in this story, children who commit murders rather than children who are murdered, that they are Fred and Rose West. Um, that there's this kind of, the child might be spectralized in Mantel's work for lots of different reasons, kind of might be put beyond the pale for lots of different reasons, but certainly that kind of local aspect, I think, is, is very much there. And I think actually really underscores how Mantel tries to represent the treatment of the Botswana and South African children in that novel. Um, I think there are, there's a lot of problems with that novel um, in some ways, in the ways that those countries and those cultures are represented. But there is Mantel, a sense for me as a reader that Mantel is trying to find this local understanding of certain kinds of children and trying to express that. And it's certainly something in my work that I'm interested in, in terms of when is a child not a child? Mm. Um, when do they kind of get excised from that, that status? Eileen or Terry, did you have anything to add in, uh, in that topic? Uh, are you okay with me going, Eileen? <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Terry. I'm actually teaching right now Maggie O'Farrell's Hamnet and Judith, which is lovely. I, I love this book. And Maggie O'Farrell said that that she couldn't write the book until her her own son was past the age of when Hamnet died, because of course her her book explores the um, the death of of Shakespeare's only son. And it does it in a very beautiful way. Um, but I think with regards to reading things about children when you have children, I agree totally. There were things I couldn't read when my children were smaller. My children are now grown up and it's a little, it's a little bit easier. So I really think there's timing. And, and if I think about, whenever I think about these spectral children um, that uh, Lucy was discussing, I always think about um, Mantel's own um, reflections on her own spectral children that she could never have. And I wonder, you know, I'm, I'm, as, as Lucy said, there are many, many influences that I think um, have Mantel writing on these children that are lost, that, that are specters. Uh, but I certainly think that's one of the big influences uh, in, in her writing about spectral children, I would say. Yeah. And Eileen, did you have anything to add on this one? Um, just that um, I uh, agree with lots of the points that have been made there. There is a passing reference to the Moors murders in flood as well. And as Lucy says, she picks up on the same ideas in giving up the ghost in various places. Um, so I think that there are a few things that I think about that. I think it's very Mantel that she makes a passing reference to something so horrifying. Um, and I think the fact that it recurs does suggest that it is significant, that it's a part of a kind of mental map around trauma and experience. Um, and just to reiterate that Kinsella in his Hole is really one of the most disturbing short stories Mantel has written, I think. Uh, but I didn't know that about uh, Fred and Rose West, Lucy. That's really interesting. Um, it's, it's a story that I actually encountered while I was at the Huntington. I read a draft of it while I was at the Huntington and was sat in the reading room kind of shuddering. And it's, it's just a little passing reference at the end and I might be kind of reading too much into it, God forbid. No, I'm sure um, you're not. But yeah, it really, it, it, yeah, the other foot really drops hard at the end of that story. Yeah, yeah, she does like a nice snap at the end of those, doesn't she? <laughs> um, uh, a bit too much of a snap sometimes. <laughs> I, I haven't read um, this story and now I'm sort of debating whether or not this is something I want to try and uh, goes to the question of when we're, <laughs> when we're in the right mental place for these things. Uh, Matt has a, a great follow-on question. Um, do these patterns of, spectrality or defamiliarization of Mantel's work tend to cluster in particular sorts of places or whether certain places have a tendency to evoke uh, more 
uh, concentrated forms of those effects? A fantastic uh, question. Would anyone like to weigh in on that one? I'm happy to uh, share thoughts about that. I think you're absolutely right. Um, I think that there are particular places and particular experiences that lend themselves to ambiguity. And, you know, the ghost is a, a really nice shortcut to those ideas of ambiguity. My personal feeling around the Northwest and, and maybe, you know, related to particular histories, um, as we've talked about in terms of the Moors murders and, and so on, is, is this sense of being on the edge um, and I think particularly, you know, that part of Derbyshire that Mantel is from is on the edge of everything. Um, so I think that there being neither one thing nor another, the um, being the outsider looking in, um, all of those very post-structural metaphors about what it is to not fit, I think are linked to place in Mantel's work um, uh, and also kind of ideas around defamiliarization because I mean when I when I used to teach theory uh, I felt that there were two sorts of students there were the sorts of students who you talked about defamiliarization and post-structural ideas and they were absolutely horrified and they wished that they never met you um, and then there were others who were just like where have you been all my life that's what my whole existence has been and I suspect that Mantel would be very much in the second camp which is where I am as well um, so that would be my response. Lucy or Terry, did you want to uh, weigh in on Matt's question? I'm happy to jump in. Um, yeah. It was really just a comment on the landscape of Derbyshire, um, which I actually think, having visited really recently, actually been up to the peaks and been to the Lady Bower Reservoir, which Mantel writes about um, in a couple of short stories, and just experiencing that landscape as profoundly unsettling and profoundly kind of alien um, and not in the way that you kind of expect a national park to be. I think there is something about the ways in which the landscapes that Mantel experiences, experienced as a child, has experienced throughout her life, shape, formally shape her writing in a really kind of profound way. I also don't think, I think living with somebody who is a geologist and kind of understands that idea of strata and the eruptions of strata through other layers of older or younger kind of things, I think that's in there as well. So I think there is both metaphorically and in a very kind of guttural way of experiencing place. I think there's something in in that local that local influence. And Terry, do you have anything to add? Well, I'm I'm a bit of a disadvantage, although I have visited Yorkshire and um, and I've been to England a few times. I'm not as familiar with the territory, so I will speak to to um, the defamiliarization inspector that Mantel. Um, certainly uh, invokes in the um, eight months on Gaza Street. Of course, the specters are the women. They're they're not people. They're 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 not recognized by all of the males in the in the society. They have no voice. And and um, you know the defamiliarization is is certainly prevalent because of course look, we are in this country where nothing works in any way that that we are used to. We think that it could work. Um, for example, um, Francis right, uh, creates a map when Fairfax comes so that she thinks that she's helping him make it to their apartment. And of course, she's a cartographer and he gets lost because he can make no sense of the map or the city. You, you can't control that, that country. And so it's, it's very much a defamiliarization there, I think, too. Fantastic. Uh, I'm going to at this point step in uh, so we don't have anything um, uh, in the, the chat right now, but please do, do put in your questions to abuse my, my position as chair and just put a, 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 a question to I think both, both Lucy and Eileen. I'm thinking of two different aspects, I suppose, of the, the, the giant O'Brien because I uh, just reread it recently and I actually couldn't figure out why I did. And then I think it was because of um, Mantel potentially moving to Ireland and sort of embracing a latent Irishness. And I actually, oh, when I first read it, thought it was such a, a terrific Irish novel in, in so many ways, but I don't know that it's appreciated as such here, actually. And I had sort of two thoughts about it as I was thinking about both of your papers. In terms of Lucy's, I was just thinking, um, and in that very powerful um, image of the fossil that you used, how you felt about uh, the various mentions of Hunter's collection uh, in, in The Giant O'Brien and the kind of, um, at least to me, 
creepy way that the collection was often spoken of, particularly in his more sort of obsessive moments and 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 uh, how that sort of might might fit in with your your discussion of the the, the fossil image and sort of relatedly then um, to Eileen, I was just sort of interested in uh, very much following on from that at the very end of of the giant O'Brien, we have this sort of almost stream of consciousness from Hunter about all the things that he desperately wants to collect and uh, uh, ending with, you know, I want knowledge and I want time. And then uh, uh, someone takes over to say, and time wants you, John, and all these images about he'll turn into a pool of water, a field of wheat, a fly, and a wind will blow the fly away. And I was wondering if in that, uh, time is the great defamiliarization that at the uh, uh, at the end, what's coming for all of us is the changes that that, that that time wreaks. And is there is there anything in particular in in that image that's worth looking at as well in 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 that novel? So I jump in there first. <laughs> um, so I think that's such a great question because I think actually in both texts, these remnants, these animal remnants, are doing quite a similar thing. Um, the fossil, I think, in a change of climate is, is enabling this meditation on kind of present absence and enabling this meditation on kind of the irrevocability of death. You can't kind of reason with it. You can't get around it. You can't kind of re narrativize it like Julian tries to do with these really poignant kind of erasings and redrawings. It's, it just it just is there. It just kind of confronts you with its enigmatic kind of refusal of any kind of rationale. Um, and any kind of narrative, really. I think the, the oddness of fossils is really crucial in that book, the, their difference to, to us and our kind of physical makeup, their strangeness. I think something similar happens in um, The Giant O'Brien because I, I can't remember now if it makes it into the, the published novel, but in the drafts, there's this kind of really poignant, heartfelt kind of plea, kind of, uh, kind of creed occur from John Hunter about kind of, and I, I have, we have an image of this actually in the Verso blog that accompanies this event, where Hunter's kind of basically saying, where are you now, you who ate and walked and spoke and loved, where have you gone? Why can't, how, it, how is this possible? How is this possible but that you were alive and now you were dead? And it's this all, almost kind of childlike kind of cry and, and um, exhortation. And it's almost as if Hunter's collection is a, is a confrontation with that. Um, I think also Mantel, Hunter's archive enables Mantel to do something very witty. I remember kind of reading through the drafts and coming across an image of Hunter juggling with the metacarpals of an ass. And I was like, well, that's an incredible thing to have made up. And then I looked at the portrait of John Hunter in the Hunterian Museum and there, the metacarpals are in the portrait. And I was like, of course, of course they are, of course they are. Um, so it's this odd kind of dual thing. Of, it's simultaneously providing this object for meditation on the inexorable march of time and also a punchline, which is absolutely Mantel, I think, for me. I think that's great. Um, love that, Lucy. Um, I think that for me, I suppose that the way that I approach it is that I feel that a lot of what Mantel's trying to do with Hunter is a little bit what I said about Thomas More, that she's she's kind of uh, taking revenge, I feel, by characterising him in the way that she does. And I think that he is childlike. Um, but I think that the big thing is this illusion of control and time. I think you're absolutely right, David, is the 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 ultimate proof that we don't have any control. Um, but I think there's a lot to be said about that section at the end in terms of using narrative voice to demonstrate that. Um, I felt that I felt that ultimately it, it was a book that was about the injustice of his skeleton remaining on view. Um, and I know that that's a big statement to make about the whole book, but I feel like the statement at the end that you drew attention to uh, where she has to take this kind of narratorial revenge on him um that he is nothing um i think that it is linked with the notes uh and i think that when i was preparing the paper the fact that it's still the case that um his skeleton still hasn't been buried i think that says an awful lot this book was published in 1998 um so i think ultimately yes i agree with you about time 
Um, but I think Mantel is always demonstrating lack of human control, that however much we want to categorise and we want to uh, understand that it slips away. Yeah, the ultimate futility of uh, uh, Hunter's efforts, I just so... Uh, wonderfully summed up at the at the very end. Um, we don't have any other questions in the, the chat at the moment, and we do have a few minutes, so I wanted to know if the panelists would like to uh, make any comments, because I know they probably have a lot of <laughs> thoughts about uh, each other's papers as well as their own, and so I just wanted to invite you to uh, uh, do that if you had uh, anything you'd like to ask your fellow, fellow panelists. I didn't want to ask anything. I just wanted to say how much I enjoyed Terry and Lucy's papers. Really, really enjoyed revisiting Eight Months on Gaza Street. That was such an interesting analysis and remembering all of the stuff around that crate and the obsession around the crate in particular. Um, I mean, that book is about control and lack of control in lots of ways too. And and just, you know, excellent, excellent paper. Lucy loved the theory, um, loved the, the combining of spectres of Marx with various other theorists just um stellar so thank you both it's been a pleasure to be on the panel with you the feeling is absolutely mutual i terry i was just blown away by the the detail of your comparison between jane Eyre and um and eight months and that's that's a novel that i have published on and i was kind of like i didn't notice that i never know that's incredible so uh, and we I, I think mantel and intertextuality is a really unmined seem in the scholarship at the moment so I'm hoping maybe we can have some more conversations um about that and I want, also wanted to say thank you to Eileen for a spectacular paper but also for giving us the phrase something of the Captain Ahabs which I'm going to try and introduce into common parlance because that is spectacular <laughs> so thank you so much it's just been an absolute pleasure and I would like to um echo my uh colleagues on the panel I thoroughly enjoyed and learned so much from both of your papers, um, obviously inspire me to go back to those texts and, and dig a little deeper. I am going to reflect a little bit back. Um, you bring up, uh, Lucy, the um, idea of intertextuality in uh, Mantel's work. And, and it's funny, when I started to write this paper, I was actually teaching um, Handmaid's Tale and I thought, and, and then I was teaching um, Jane Eyre. And that's when I started to make all these connections. And, and at the same, in the same class, I had taught um, the yellow wallpaper, but I only kind of really thought about the yellow wallpaper more recently. But uh, what I was thinking about is in uh, Lucy's uh, presentation of the, the stitchery in, um, in Mantel's uh, Wolf Hall and, and the, the trilogy, the Cromwell trilogy, and, and how that is just another form of Mantel um, sometimes she uses that term resting on the shoulders of, uh, she's resting on the shoulders of some of the really interesting uh, texts and narratives of all kinds of different types and, and media that, that she is, you know, I guess you could say she's recognizing this, this literary history that, that isn't always, it's not traditional, so it's not always recognized. Uh, and I know she, I, I can think of other ways that she's done that in other books, but um, I'm starting to want to go back and look at some of the ways that she's tapping into these female voices in very unusual ways. I think it, it's a very interesting idea. Yeah. Well, fabulous. I think it's uh, uh, probably as good a place as any then to uh, uh, draw a halt to our, our conversation this evening and just left to me before I hand back over to Steve to thank so much uh, our three panelists for absolutely uh, fabulous papers and a great discussion. Thank you all so much. And thank you, David, for chairing the session so expertly. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us this morning or this afternoon or this evening or wherever you are. Uh, I think we can all agree that this has been a fabulously successful series of conversations sparked by some tremendous papers. So thank you to all of those who've uh, shared their perspectives on Hilary Mantel with us. I'd briefly like to take the opportunity to remind you that the Mantel Literary Archive is held at the Huntington, that each year the Huntington Research Division gives away about $2 million in research funding to scholars from all over the world who want to come and use our collections. The closing date for this year's application cycle is November the 15th. Uh, and you can apply for fellowships of a year, if you wish, or for as short a period as a month. Uh, and I would be very, very happy to answer any questions about the fellowship application process and the peer review process 
if uh, any of you uh, on the panel or um, out there in the audience have an interest in making such an application. Um, we have had a steady trickle of people using the Mantel papers over recent years, but we are very keen to fund more scholarship in that archive, as you can imagine. And one of the reasons that we were so keen to do this conference working with Eileen and Lucy was to, to publicize the presence of the archive at the Huntington. So uh, please don't hesitate to get in touch about any of that. Um, so tomorrow we'll convene at 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, which Lucy is uh, nine, uh, 5 p.m. with you in Normandy. So don't be late for your own party. Um, and we will begin in the morning with the conversation that Lucy so generously pre-recorded with Ben Miles. Uh, and I think that will get us off to a terrific start. So thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, have a pleasant afternoon and evening, and we will see you tomorrow. Thank you, everybody.